Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Hemolytic Disease of Newborn Part 2. In this video, we will finish our discussion on hemolytic disease of newborn and talk about the diagnosis, management and prevention of this disease. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first we will talk about the diagnosis. How can we diagnose hemolytic disease of newborn or erythroblastosis fetalis? Now always remember, definitive diagnosis requires demonstration of blood group incompatibility and also demonstration of corresponding antibody bound to infant's red blood cells. We can diagnose this disease before birth or after birth. First, let's talk about antenatal diagnosis or diagnosis before birth. When the mother is Rh negative, a history of previous transfusion, abortion, or pregnancy should suggest the possibility of sensitization. At first prenatal visit, the mother should be screened for her blood type, Rh type, anti-Rhd antibodies, and any other antibody that can cause this disease. If the mother has Rh negative blood and is positive for anti-RHD antibody or positive for any other antibody that can cause erythroblastosis fetalis, father's blood type and zygocity should also be determined. Now if the father is Rh negative and also negative for antigen corresponding to the antibody identified in the mother's blood, no further testing is necessary. But if the father is Rh positive or has the antigen corresponding to the antibody identified in the mother's blood, maternal anti-Rh antibody titers are measured. Now, the maternal titer for immunoglobulin G antibodies to D antigen should be assayed at 12 to 16, 28 to 32, and 36 week of gestation. Elevated antibody titers at the beginning of pregnancy or a rapid rise in the titer or a titer of 1 is to 64 or greater will suggest significant hemolytic disease. Now, if the mother has antibody against D antigen at a titer of 1 is to 16 or greater at any time during a subsequent pregnancy, severity of fetal disease should be monitored by detecting fetal middle cerebral artery blood flow with the help of Doppler ultrasonography. Now, if we see elevated blood flow with the help of Doppler ultrasonography, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling and intrauterine blood transfusion may be considered. Fetal Rh status may be determined by isolation of fetal cells or fetal DNA from maternal circulation. Information obtained from ultrasonography and percutaneous umbilical blood sampling may help in assessment of fetus. Now to detect the progression of disease, real-time ultrasonography is also used. Now here we are seeing the early ultrasonographic signs of high drops. They will include organomegaly, bowel edema and thickening of placenta. Progression to polyhydramnios, ascites, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, skin or scalp edema may follow. 
So all these are ultrasonographic features of high drops that we can see in a case of hemolytic disease of newborn. Now if ultrasonography shows features of fetal hepatosplenomegaly, high drops or fetal distress, more direct assessment of fetal hemolysis should be performed. Amniocentesis is an invasive procedure in which ultrasonography guided transabdominal aspiration of amniotic fluid is performed. It may be performed as early as 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. Now after aspirating amniotic fluid, we can do spectrophotometric scanning of the aspirated amniotic fluid and it can measure the amount of bilirubin that enters in the amniotic fluid when the fetus has hyperbilirubinemia. And why will the fetus have hyperbilirubinemia? Because in hemolytic disease of newborn, there is hemolysis of red blood cells, and that's why bilirubin level will be increased in the blood. So that will lead to hyperbilirubinemia, and bilirubin will also enter into the amniotic fluid, and we can measure that with the help of spectrophotometric scanning. Cordocentesis or percutaneous umbilical cord blood sampling is another invasive diagnostic test that examines blood from fetal cord to detect fetal abnormalities. The procedure is similar to amniocentesis except the goal here is to retrieve blood from fetal umbilical cord instead of retrieving amniotic fluid from amniotic sac. Now always remember both amniocentesis and cordocentesis are invasive procedures with risks to both fetus and mother. Risks will include fetal death, bleeding, bradycardia, chorioamnionitis that is inflammation of the chorion and amnion, premature rupture of membrane, preterm labor, etc. So it is always desirable to detect fetal anemia by non-invasive procedures whenever it is possible. With the help of Doppler ultrasonography, moderate to severe anemia can be detected non-invasively by demonstrating increased velocity of systolic blood flow in the middle cerebral artery. If Doppler and real-time ultrasonography findings suggest erythroblastosis fetalis, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling is the standard approach in assessment of the fetus. Percutaneous umbilical blood sampling is performed to determine hemoglobin level of the fetus. It can also be performed to transfuse packed red blood cells into fetus with severe anemia. For example, when the fetus has hematocrit level of 25 to 30%. So now we will talk about postnatal diagnosis or diagnosis after birth. Immediately after birth of an infant to RH negative mother, blood from umbilical cord or from infant should be examined for ABO blood group, RH blood group, hemoglobin level, hematocrit, reaction to direct Coombs test. If direct Coombs test result is positive, baseline serum bilirubin level should be determined. Commercially available red blood cell panel should be used to identify red blood cell antibodies. So here we are seeing some findings in the lab. Blood picture will include decreased level of hemoglobin, red cell indices are normal, reticulocyte count will be increased, and the white blood cells will show neutrophilic leukocytosis. In the blood film, what will be the finding? Red blood cells are normochromic normocytic, mild anisocytosis and well hemoglobinized macrocytosis may be seen. There will be reticulocytosis and presence of numerous 
nucleated immature red blood cells which are called erythroblast and that's why the disease is also known as erythroblastosis fetalis. WBC will show neutrophilic leukocytosis. Coombs test, positive direct Coombs test and serum bilirubin level will be increased during first 24 hours after birth. So now that we have talked about the diagnosis of this disease, now we will move on and talk about the prevention of hemolytic disease of newborn. Administration of intramuscular injection of 300 microgram of human anti-D-globulin to Rh negative mother within 72 hours of delivery of an Rh positive infant, ectopic pregnancy, amniocentesis, chorionic villus biopsy, abdominal trauma in pregnancy or after abortion has reduced the risk of initial sensitization to less than 1%. Administration of human anti-D globulin at 28 to 32 weeks and again after birth is more effective than a single dose. So now that we have talked about the prevention of this disease, now we will move on and talk about its treatment. The main goals are to prevent death of the baby from severe anemia and hypoxia and also to avoid neurotoxicity from hyperbilirubinemia. So how can we treat the fetus before birth? Blood transfusion is an option. If fetal anemia is likely, the fetus may require in utero intravascular transfusion of packed red blood cells. Now, diazepam and pancuronium drugs are quite helpful during such intravascular fetal transfusion. Diazepam facilitates by maternal and fetal sedation. Pancuronium helps by causing fetal paralysis during the transfusion. Packed red blood cells should be obtained from cytomegalovirus negative donor and the packed red blood cells are also irradiated to kill lymphocytes in order to prevent graft versus host disease. After being cross-matched against mother's serum, packed red blood cells are given by slow push infusion to achieve a hematocrit of 45 to 55 percent. Transfusion may be repeated every three to five weeks. Another treatment option is preterm delivery. In certain situations, preterm delivery may be needed. But always remember the baby's lungs and heart must be mature enough for preterm delivery. Indications will include fetal distress, complications of percutaneous umbilical blood sampling, lung maturity, and 35 to 37 weeks of gestation. Now, what are the treatment options after birth? One option is exchange transfusion. It is a special type of transfusion in which small samples of baby's blood, for example, like 5 to 10 ml of blood, are taken out and simultaneously replaced by donor's blood. The procedure is repeated several times. Another treatment option is phototherapy. It is a relatively inexpensive and non-invasive method of treating neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Here the baby is illuminated by a special type of light that converts bilirubin into water-soluble isomer that can be then easily excreted by urine. Another treatment option is the use of immunoglobulin Early administration of intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG may reduce hemolysis, duration of phototherapy, and the need for exchange transfusions. The dose is usually from 0.5 to 1 gram per kg body weight. So this concludes today's video on hemolytic disease of newborn. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, 
I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.